are exploring Death Valley National Park, and something doesn't appear right. You pitch up your tent, settle in for the night, and wake up to notice something is strange. Were there animals strolling through the night? Is the weather weird? Is there something in the air? Materials Lab. These rocks move all by themselves. You are wandering around the park and want to figure out what is happening. Finally, you realize that maybe one stone is in a different place from yesterday. This happened to Richard Norris and his cousin Jim Norris in December 2013. They arrived as the plier was covered in a pond of water three inches deep. Suddenly, the rocks began moving right in front of them. We had set the, started this project thinking that we might have to run it for 10 years mm -hmm. before something happened. Richard and Jim observed that the rocks require a rare combination of conditions. The plier must fill up with water and be deep enough to form floating ice during cold winter nights, but must still be shallow enough to expose the rocks. The wind brushing across these kilometer scale panels of ice, floating ice, develops quite a bit of force. And then it starts to move. And the thing is, if there are any rocks sitting on the bottom of this playa, sticking up through the ice, as soon as the ice starts moving, it starts pushing on the stones. The stones are sitting on this very slippery bottom now because it's been submerged in water. These sliding rock tracks have been the subject of studies ever since the early 1900s. The reasons behind the moving stones would not be revealed until the 2000s. This opened the door to many hypotheses about why and how the stones moved on the plier. The first account to document the phenomenon was in 1915, when a man named Joseph Crook from Nevada was visiting the racetrack plier. Over the years, the plier has received a lot of interest from geologists. In 1948, Jim McAllister and Alan Agnew mapped the bedrock area and published a report about the sliding rocks in a Geological Society of America bulletin. A National Park Ranger in 1952 named Lewis G. Kirk recorded furrow length, width and general course. It was around this time that speculation about how the stones moved began. These ideas were either very complex or involved the supernatural. In 1955, George M. Stanley produced a paper on the subject. After extensive track mapping and research, he connected ice sheets to be the initial reason for the movement. Moving forward to the 1970s, Bob Sharp and Dwight Carey started a racetrack stone monitoring program. They named and labeled 30 stones. Ten of these stones moved in the first winter. In the seven-year period, only two stones didn't move. One of these was called Karen, a block of dolomite weighing 700 pounds. Although Karen didn't move during the research period, it did disappear before May in 1944. It's been suggested that Karen was spotted half a mile from the plier. Fortunately, Karen was rediscovered by Paula Messina from San Jose in 1996. Research would continue until Richard Norris, Jim Norris and Jib Ray published their findings. And first of all, you know, it's simpler than you ever think. It's not a particularly complicated mechanism. And of course, that's how nature oftentimes is. It's not necessarily all that complicated. We make it complicated. Now that the case of the Sailing Stones has been solved, you are more than welcome to visit the racetrack, and you may get lucky and visually see the rocks move. If you decide to visit, just remember to leave the rocks there and do not take them home. Nor should you drive on the sands, as someone did in 2016, causing 10 miles of tire tracks left in the plier. A team of volunteers cleared the tire tracks from the racetrack in 2018 using 750 gallons of water. Perhaps there are more secrets that the racetrack hasn't provided us yet. Time.
will tell.